born in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. My father was a traveling salesman. He'd been in World War I right at the end of the war and decided being an enlisted man in the Army wasn't the way to go, so he was sent to Culver Military Academy to take ROTC mainly and get a commission. That started my military education. In 1940, Jay Zemer was already a second lieutenant in the Army Reserve when he began training as a cadet in the Army Air Corps. He received his wings less than a year later, around the same time that he graduated with a degree in civil engineering from MIT. In October of 1942, Zemer was promoted to captain and sent to the Pacific Theater, where he began flying a B-17 he called Lucy in reconnaissance missions over the Solomon Islands. A notice was put on a bulletin board asking for volunteers to photomap Bougainville Island. All my fellows volunteered for put their names down on this bulletin board. That crew of mine was always ready to fly. We'd fly anything that needed to be done. On June 16th, they called me and said, tomorrow's the day. We're finally getting a day clear enough. So we worked like mad that whole day getting the airplane finally ready. So then by about 10 o'clock, my phone rang. He said, this is group operations. You're going to Bougainville Island to map Bougainville in the morning. Well, while you're up there, we want you to do a reconnaissance of Buka Passage. I said, hell no, I'm going up to do a mapping and that's it. And nobody's going to interfere with that. I just hung the phone up before I even found out the name of the guy who was talking to me. Got in the air, beautiful takeoff. The air was just clear as a bell. But the sun wasn't high enough yet to do mapping. So we had to kill half an hour. So I called the crew on the interphone and said, we can fly out over the ocean for 15 minutes and go back to this, our starting point here. Or if we really wanted to, we could fly to Buka Passage and do the reconnaissance and come back here and start the mapping. And they came back to me and said, what the hell, let's do their damn reconnaissance. As we went over doing the reconnaissance, a couple of crew members came on the interphone and said, I count 22, either taxiing or taking off. And this is a little different from the six we'd seen two weeks previously. 22 is a different kettle of fish. I had to make the decision quicker than we're talking about it. I knew the mapping had to be done that day. We're almost through. We figured we'd be through in 22 minutes. And after 21 minutes and 15 seconds, crew called and the fighters coming in. At this one at 10 o'clock, they right at us and started hitting, getting 20 millimeter shells in us. One ripped out my side window, another got through the end of the nose set by Bombardier Sarnowski, but Sarnowski shot him down. And the one shell exploded behind my seat and ignited our oxygen system and hydraulic system. Both my wrists had been hit, then 20 millimeter exploded through my left knee, shattered it. My flight instruments had blown out of the panel and they're hanging down on the wires. There was blood running down from on my hands, and my hands were slippery on the wheel, but I figured we had to get the hell out of there, because there's 17 more pulling up on the tail. So I just rolled the airplane over on the right, pushed it into a steep dive, and I figured if we got it one more time, we'd be done. I just started heading. I didn't know what direction. So I couldn't go home by the sun, because it was straight up then. This was about 12 o'clock. We strained out at about 10,000 feet, and the zeros started to line up on both sides. I count about seven or eight on one side and about the same number on the other side. And I just rolled over and pulled back for all I was worth to make a side step. I must have done that maneuver about six or seven times, so I had to fly that thing like crazy. We didn't need any more hits. After nearly an hour of deadly cat and mouse, the Japanese Zeros, low on fuel, were forced to turn back. With the enemy in retreat, the crew had averted one disaster, but they were still facing another, how to find their way back home. With some improvisation, the radio operator was able to rig a communications link to base and retrieve the necessary coordinates. Six hours later, 
the battered survivors finally touch down to safety. And all of a sudden, I thought the wheels touched the ground. All I could see was gray. I was passing out off and on, loss of blood. I could hear him say, get the pilot last, he's dead. I felt like raising my head and telling him he's full of <laughs> But I didn't have the strength. But a moment later, I felt myself being pulled up out of the top of the airplane by my shoulders. And the next morning, they flew me back to Port Moresby to be in a station hospital there. So the nurse came in one day and told me to, I had a phone call on her phone. So I picked up the phone, the voice said, is this Major Zemer? I said, yes. She said, this is Major Vanderwalk in the Pentagon. Would you like to get your medal here in your hometown? And I said, but I have all my medals. They gave them to me in New Guinea before I left New Guinea. I told them I have the Silver Star twice. I have the Distinguished Flying Cross twice. I have the Air Medal twice. And I have the Purple Heart. And he said, you don't have the Congressional Medal of Honor. I said, hell, nobody, nobody has that one. And about two days later, they came around, picked me up, put me in a staff car, and drove me to the Pentagon. When my father and mother were there. They made the presentation right there. That's the first time I knew I was getting the Medal of Honor. Both Captain Zemer and his bombardier, Second Lieutenant Joseph Sarnowski, were awarded the Medal of Honor for their flight that day. Sarnowski, posthumously. He had managed to shoot down two enemy aircraft before succumbing to his wounds, allowing Zemer to complete the mission. It was one of the few times that two members of the same crew were awarded the medal for the same mission. There are hundreds of incidents for every one medal that was awarded. People did acts that would deserve it but were never observed or never written up and never reported. So when I wear it, I feel it's representative of all those others that were never recognized.